It's such a pleasure to have all of you here. We have a full audience, Dr. Johnson in Canada. We have a full audience and we have approximately 200 students all over the world. Oh, wow! <laughs> <laughs> They're in North America, South America, Africa, Australia, Taiwan, India, and many, many more countries. Goodness me, okay. <laughs> and as you know, as Dr. Excuse me, as Mr. Tom Downer just mentioned, uh, Cal Southern is part of a global community with participants in the Master Lecture Series in over 71 countries. And the intent of our lecture series is to provide our students with the most effective evidence-based treatment modalities today. So that's why I'm especially pleased to have Dr. Johnson, who is known not only as a researcher, but also <coughs> a clinical psychologist, et cetera, et cetera, but she's done much research in the field of neurosciences, and for that we're greatly appreciative. Uh, we live in very exciting times today with the advent and explosion of technology, social media, and research in the neurosciences. And it's really revolutionized the way we think about our brains, our relationships, and our world. They propose that our brain is adaptable, that we're hardwired for social interaction. So that is why I'm so pleased that we have Dr. Johnson talking today about the new science of romantic love. What you understand, you can shape. Dr. Johnson will be exploring the underlying dynamics today of coupled interaction from an evidence-based, attachment-based perspective, and focus not only in helping couples to repair the emotional ravages of distrust, anger, and disconnection, but also how do we reshape the brain to recreate a sense of safety, security, and transform those relationships in the words of Dr. Johnson, into a tango of love, excitement, and adventure. Dr. Johnson, as I mentioned, is a noted author, clinical psychologist, research, and she's known especially for this innovative therapeutic approach to couples therapy known as emotionally focused therapy. It has become the gold standard in empirically validated research in the treatment of couples. Some things you might not know is her first book, Hold Me Tight um, is a well-known bestseller, and she has a new one, which I'm in the process of reading, Love Sex, the Revolutionary New Science of Romantic Relationships. Dr. Johnson is the founder of the International Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy, and she trains counselors and provides consultations to over 35 inter international institutes. She's a professor emeritus of clinical psychology at the University of Ottawa and a distinguished research professor at Alliant University in San Diego. So without further ado, Dr. Johnson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to assume that um, you're going to tell me if you can't hear me. So. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I think you will get as I start speaking that um, I never get tired of talking about this topic because, after all, is there anything that human beings uh, are more interested in and uh, want to understand more than love relationships, how they go wrong, why they're so important, and how to make them last? And is there anything more revolutionary, I'm going to ask you, than to, uh, for me to say to you that we have cracked the code of romantic love, that we can actually, uh, I can actually give a lecture where I talk to you about the science of love and actually deliberately shaping it. If you really think about that, that is an incredible shift because it's really not too long ago that you couldn't talk about love and science in the same sentence without people laughing at you. Um, the father of attachment theory, John Bowlby, which I'm going to suggest to you, has, did, really did crack the code of love, uh, beginning in about the 1960s. Um, he was reputed to have sat at his kitchen table 
writing about what he called attachment theory and his wife said to him, well, why are you calling it that? It's really a theory of love. And he said, don't be ridiculous. If I call it a theory of love, basically everyone will hate me, everyone will laugh at me, no one will listen. So we have assumed over the years that um, of all the mysteries of life, you know, love, a romantic love, is definitely an impenetrable mystery. Um, really, when you look at it, the nearest we've got is to suggest that it's some sort of strange, almost psychotic mixture of sex and sentiment. And the implication is that you can't understand it. If you listen to the words we use, you fall in love, you fall out. It sort of like comes along and hits you in the head. You know, it, there's not, it's not something you can shape. And for years we've been teaching students, well, you can maybe um, give people some tips on their communication cues. You might be able to um, teach them a few communication skills, like not being so nasty to each other. You might be able to reduce a little bit of conflict here and there or get people to be friends. But the idea of actually creating bonding moments in therapy that transform a love relationship and indeed create more secure bonds and more sense of felt sense of being loved and loving, that, um, that is new. That involves us shifting our head in a number of ways. And as I talk to you, I think you'll hear that this new science has some pretty re revolutionary insights. One of the big ones for our field is that our field has pretty much distrusted dependency on other people. Um, we've had all kinds of theories through the years where we've talked about um, things like enmeshment. We've talked about the fact that the problem with relationships is there's too much closeness. There's, um, it's, there's fusion, there's symbiosis. We've got all kinds of words for it. Lack of differentiation. Um, and, you know, this kind of, there's all kinds of words that basically pathologize dependency. So really, this new science says, no, we are by nature dependent. We are by nature, um, our brains are tuned to um, find others and hold on to others. That love is ancient, actually an ancient, wired-in survival code designed to keep the people you love close to you. And that this is a powerful survival code and an adaptive survival code. And the strongest among us actually accept that we need other people and learn how to create what we call constructive dependency. Constructive dependency, or you could call it secure attachment. Constructive dependency is where I accept my need for attachment. I accept my need for emotional connection and support. I can regulate my emotions enough to tune into those needs. I, can, I know how to reach for the people I love in a way that pulls them close. And when I pull them close, I can take in their caring and their support and it actually makes me stronger. It makes me feel better about myself. It reassures me that I can face danger it, and survive. It helps me have the confidence to explore the world. So that's just one of the kind of revolutionary shifts that's come out of this research. And there are more coming. One of the most interesting ones, perhaps if we're talking about a romantic love, is that attachment researchers have started to look at sexuality and come up with some really um, interesting links between bonding and sexuality that I think starts to change our view of sexuality. One of the big things in our society when people talk about sexuality is they say, well, familiarity and long-term relationships are almost antithetical to passion and desire. They just don't go together, you know, and attachment research really questions that. So attachment research, and I write, I'm starting to write about this now, basically says, no, that's not true. Um, love, uh, making love, um, 
sexuality at its best is an incredible act of attunement and coordination. And emotional safety potentiates that attunement and coordination. And the evidence is that securely attached folks are the folks that actually have the best sex, find it most thrilling, and make love most often. So I'm trying to give you in a nutshell that this new way of looking at romantic relationships has got some very revolutionary aspects to it that will shift our thinking. Perhaps the biggest shift of all is to say that in general in Western society we've accepted that the most powerful instincts in man are sex and aggression. And what John Bowlby basically said was, uh, no, there is a more primary instinct than that. It is called the longing for emotional connection with another human being. And what he basically said is that is the most powerful drive in man because it is a survival drive. I just want you to think about that. If you think, well, that's a bit abstract. I just want you to think about that just for a moment in terms of doing couples therapy, for example. If I really believe that that instinct is the most powerful thing in man, when somebody turns and says, well, I don't like this relationship and I don't really feel anything when my partner says that they're going to leave me and I don't really need anything uh, from this person, what my, where my brain goes is, how are you blocking off that most powerful instinct? And how can I help you move into the longing that is there for that connection? Because it's wired in. You don't get to choose that. It's wired into your mammalian brain. So then I go into, what are the blocks here? That, so this new way of thinking translates into very new ways of working with couples. But let me just slow down a bit and back up. Um, let me put it in a slightly different, um, more narrative way. So a few months ago, um, I went to um, here Bizet's Carmen. Um, and um, my husband didn't really want to go. So I was kind of off balance when I went to listen to it. And in the first few minutes of Bizet's Carmen, Carmen walks out onto the, the stage and seduces 30 soldiers by raising her left eyebrow and sings a song where she says, love is a gypsy child, a gypsy child that knows no law. And um, I had to catch myself because I was actually so sort of not focused that I had this incredible desire to leap up out of my seat and say, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, used to think that, but mistake, uh, tons of research now. Um, and I wanted to actually just leap up and say, because we really do know the laws of love. We really have cracked the code of love. And that has amazing, amazing implications for couples, for families, for helping people understand what goes wrong in relationships in a time when our societies are becoming lonelier and lonelier and we are facing epidemic uh, numbers of depression and anxiety, um, it seems to me that we are absolutely have to understand the laws of love, and now it seems that we can. So adult attachment, um, you know, has been really going only since about 1990, and it didn't start there. All this started not with people deciding to study love, but it started with people like John Bowlby way back in the 50s and 60s um, deciding to study loneliness and loss and interviewing widows and um, interviewing orphans after World War II. And that's quite interesting because that's actually where um, most of the social science research on attachment started. Um, Phil Shaver, for example, at Davis, um, was looking at loneliness um, and how come loneliness was so painful. And then it kind of segued into, well, what is that about? What is this incredible longing? What is this sense of loss that is so devastating? And they started to look at love relationships and they started to look back 
at John Bowlby's basic research on the bonding between mother and child. And what's fascinating about that is that that's kind of what happened to me. Um, I started working with couples. I was a humanistic therapist. I'd, I'd um, done Rogerian type individual therapy. I'd worked with families using a Mnuchin model. And I kind of struggled to work with couples and started taping them and put together what seemed to work. And goodness me, it did work. We did this study and it worked. But I didn't really understand why we'd got those results. It was still, it was still somehow mysterious. And then one day in a conversation with a colleague, it suddenly hit me that we were getting those results because we were dealing with the most basic drama in any couple, the drama of connection and disconnection. We were getting those results because we were moving people into bonding moments and John Bowlby had told us all about that. He'd shown us how that works when he, he was looking at the bonding between mother and child. By the way, John Bowlby always said that attachment goes from the cradle to the grave. It doesn't stop at 12. We never outgrow our need for others. But as adults, we don't need others there all the time. We carry others with us in our mind. So I invite you to think about that when you're in difficult situations, when you feel uncertain, when you feel maybe a little vulnerable or fragile, you either call a partner, you call somebody you rely on, or you even access them in your mind. Um, I give the example that years ago I developed an airplane phobia, which is really unfortunate because I take a lot of planes. <laughs> and um, basically I tried all, I mean I'm a psychologist, I had like thousands of techniques and strategies that I looked at. The one that worked the best was that as the plane took off down the runway, I listened to my husband's voice in my head. And I trust that voice. And that voice soothes my nervous system. It changes the hormones um, that are released into my blood. It probably reduces the cortisol um, stress hormone that's being released into my blood. It calms my heart rate down. And it gives me this image of safe haven that I have with him. So he would say, would I let you do anything dangerous? You're going to go speak to all these people, and then you're going to come back home to me, and I'm here. You can come home to me. And my whole body would respond to that. That is accessing an attachment figure in order to um, calm your nervous system, in order to deal with stress, in order to regain your emotional balance. And what we really starting to understand about love relationships is how much lovers impact each other. A journalist asked me the other day, um, you know, if you had to just say one thing to couples that they don't know, this is an impossible question, right? But if you had to say one thing to lovers that they don't, they really don't get, what would you say? So that's really kind of difficult. <laughs> I basically said, lovers have no idea the impact they have on each other. No idea because they don't understand that they are dancing this dance of survival. And it's a dance that their brain completely, completely is wired into in terms of safety and danger. Disc, if you're a bonding mammal, disconnection from those you depend on is um, seized by your brain as a danger cue. And so, for example, lovers do not understand how they trigger each other. Good example is that withdrawers, you know, we know now that in love relationships, the most basic dance of distress that couples get into is one person demands, demands closeness, demands connection, pushes, complains. And you can see it as a demand. We usually see it as protest. One person is trying to say, where are you? Where are you? Are you there for me? The other person hears it as aggression or a threat and they shut down and they shut the other person out. What they don't understand is that because they are bonding mammals, when they shut the other person out, that is a threat. And the other person will experience it as a threat and as a danger cue. 
and it will simply increase their upset. They will go more and more into feeling disconnected. When an EFT therapist, and that's the therapy we do that's based on this new science, when an EFT therapist looks at a distressed couple, we don't see lack of communication skills or personality disorders per se or um, you know, all kinds of other things that we talk about. We don't see they need conflict management. What we see is that they are struggling with moments of disconnection, chronic disconnection, and the way they deal with those moments of disconnection actually push their partner away from them rather than pull them close. So they just get caught in a dreadful pattern of pushing for connection, missing each other, threatening each other. They get caught in this. So from an EFT point of view, conflict, which marital interventions have focused on since the beginning of time, um, conflict is really not the issue. Conflict is the inflammation. The virus is emotional disconnection. Emotional disconnection with, um, with, with two mammals who have brains tuned to monitor and to um, seek connection and to see disconnection in terms of threat. This is a very different way of looking at a love relationship. You know, it's not that long ago that um, I was a student seeing my first couple and uh, I was pretty confident. I'd seen lots of individual clients using a Rogerian approach and lots of families using Mnuchin type interventions and um, when that couple first worked into my office, I couldn't believe how completely um, useless and incompetent I felt. Um, I couldn't stop them fighting. I didn't really understand what they were fighting about. It was pretty obvious to me they weren't just fighting about content issues. There was something much more heavy at stake. Um, they would get angry at me or somebody would shut down and not talk. Um, I was completely, completely lost. And so I went and looked at all the different ways of understanding this drama. Oh, they had, didn't have any communication skills. Uh, they weren't interested in, in learning communication skills. But the interesting thing is that even if I taught communication skills to them, they couldn't use them when they needed them, which is when they were threatened and upset. They could only use them when they were calm and in emotional balance. <laughs> and I think that's just like the rest of us. Um, that that's true. The, the thing with skills is it's often not an acquisition problem, it's an access problem. And so then I read books on, on uh, you know, family of origin and, and books on collusion and projective identification and tried to give people insights into their past. And people would say, yeah, 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 I know that this sensitivity of mine comes from my past and that's very interesting. And then they just go back to um, berating their partner. So I not only didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to understand the drama that was in front of my face, the powerful emotions, the visceral responses, and the, the momentum behind it. The fact that it would just pick up the couple and this dance, the emotion is the music of the dance, but these emotions and the way the couple treated each other would just carry the relationship off, right? So um, it is an amazing thing. Every time I talk about this, it still hits me. It is an amazing thing for me to say to you, um, things have really changed. We really have a map to adult romantic love. And bonding science has already revolutionized parenting in the Western world in the last 40 years. We see children differently. We understand children's emotional needs differently. We respond to them differently. We know we need to respond to children. We don't drop them off at the hospital and go back and pick them up five days later, which is what they used to do, even as late as the 70s. Okay. And now I think really it's time for this new bonding science to revolutionize romantic relationships. What this science does is I think it has enormous implications for all of us, but at least what this science does is it gives clinicians like myself a map 
to the drama, to the key elements in the drama that are driving the drama and that you need to change. You don't have to change everything in a couple relationship. You have to change the core organizing elements. The core organizing elements are how people deal with their emotions and send emotional signals to each other. And then how those emotional signals create a dance that either um, leads into secure connection or into painful chronic disconnection. So you start to understand the drama, you start to understand that your goal is not just to calm people down, make them a bit nicer, but help them move into a bonding dance of secure connection where they know how to turn and pull each other close. That is the way to get lasting change in couple therapy. And the, uh, we have about 17 outcome studies now, positive outcome studies, nine studies of change in therapy. We know how we get these changes. And we have, I can't remember if it's three or four, um, but m for sure, three main, very positive, um, long-term, long-term for a couple therapy means two to three years, um, long-term follow-up studies that suggest that we have stable results. So we have come a long, long way. And this map tells you where to go in therapy, what to focus on, what to change. John Gottman, who is a wonderful colleague to me and who I admire very much, him and I argue sometimes and he says to me, um, couples fight about sex, parenting and money. And I say, no, they don't. <laughs> couples have differences about those things. And if you're securely connected, you can deal with those kinds of differences because they don't scare you. They're just about the topic. They don't really say anything about your relationship, right? But what I talk about is that really significant fights that define the relationship are always and only about one question, the attachment bonding question. Are you there for me? Do I matter to you? Let's do it in are you there? Are you accessible to me? Can I reach you? Will you here when I call, are you responsive, emotionally responsive to me? Do you feel my pain? Can I see when I look into your face that my emotions impact you? Do you respond to me emotionally? Are you engaged with me? Will you come and be with me as a partner in my life? A-R-E, are you there for me? And all relationship distress from an attachment point of view results from a no or maybe answer to that question. And what we do in therapy is we create bonding moments where, where partners can actually feel that the answer to that question is yes. And I say feel because the way we work is EFT is an experiential therapy. This means it's not a coaching therapy. It's not a top-down approach. You don't give insight. It's not powerful enough. Um, it's, it's not about giving explanations. In an experiential therapy, you believe in the old, old ad adage that was created years ago to explain why therapy worked, which is that therapy works through a corrective emotional experience. And what we try to give people is a corrective emotional experience of secure connection. If you're interested in whether we can do that or not, there's um, an early bird version of the attachment study we just did up on the website of the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy where we show that we can not only change um, satisfaction and over the years we've shown that we've changed depressive symptoms, PTSD symptoms, trust, intimacy, all kinds of things. But this study shows that we not only change satisfaction in the relationship, we can actually create more secure attachment. And that's pretty significant um, in, in just 20 sessions, which is what these couples um, received. So I could talk to you a long time about this science. Let me just say that neuroscience, all the neuroscience research that's going on is supporting the, the, the bonding science that's happening. I'll give you a good example. Nancy Eisenberger in um, LA 
has pointed out that we talk about hurt feelings in relationships as a metaphor. But in fact, we are bonding social animals. So hurt feelings are not a metaphor. Particularly in your most important relationships, the evidence is if you look at people in a brain scan machine, in your most important relationships, um, getting a cue that you are about to be rejected, excluded, or criticized um, by someone you depend on is processed in the same part of the brain and exactly the same way as physical pain. That makes perfect sense because, you know, for a, ma a mammal who depends on calling others and have them come, getting cues of rejection and abandonment are danger cues. So your brain doesn't really distinguish that much between getting massive rejection on your partner's face and stepping on a nail. So when people say, I hurt, lady in my office this morning said, this hurts, I don't know why. He shuts me out. I'm an adult. Why should that hurt so much? But it hurts. It hurts here. And I say, yes. And I take her literally. It hurts. This is how our body tunes into connection and disconnection. So there's all kinds of new science. We could talk, I could talk to you about the evidence that more secure connection with others is a source of strength. I could talk to you about the fact that, for example, after 9-11, um, if you looked at the, or there was a research study of the people who were really in the vicinity of the towers. And they, what they found was that the people who were there at that time, but who could said they could turn to others, confide in them, ask for comfort, trust that comfort, and create this secure connection, were basically doing just fine 18 months later. Uh, the people who could not do that were not. The people who said they were fine, they didn't need other people, were particularly vulnerable to PTSD. And, but the people who were anxious and said, well, they tried to connect with other people, but they weren't really sure that other people wanted to be there for them, and they tried a lot, but it didn't really work. They weren't doing so well either. So when I say to you that secure attachment doesn't mean that we're needy and weak or enmeshed or not differentiated, secure attachment is the royal road to strength, flexibility, confidence, and the ability to explore the world and take risks, I am not giving you an opinion. I'm giving you something that is substantiated by research study after research study after research study in all kinds of different contexts. So we have a new science of love, and this science of love says that the main um, element that defines a secure loving bond that lasts is emotional responsiveness. Being able to reach somebody emotionally, create that emotional connection, and trust that you can engage with them when you need them, that they will be there for you. That is what defines a secure bond. And an insecure bond is where you don't trust that, you're not sure that's going to happen, you don't know how to do that, and so what you, what you do is you end up pushing for this connection or um, being very agitated, monitoring it all the time, being preoccupied with it and never feeling sure you're loved. Or you end up denying your need and saying other people are dangerous. It's way too dangerous to need others. I'm not going to do it. Now, I'm going through attachment theory at a lightning speed. So I invite you to read some of the articles and chapters that I've written on attachment and other attachment theorists. But let me do another lightning one for you because I want to talk about EFT and our interventions. If you look at attachment theory and you look at love as a dance between two people, there's really only um, three basic moves in the dance of love. Hey, that's pretty different than thinking that love's a mystery. I'm telling you, we know what it is, we know where it matters, and there's already only three basic moves. So what are the three basic moves? If you watch a securely attached mother and child, for example, I invite you to go on YouTube and look at Edtronic Developmental Psychologist's YouTube called Still Face. 
If you watch the mother and baby there, you will see that really the baby only has, well, actually the baby has four moves, but three actions. Um, when the mother stops relating to the baby and goes still, and the baby picks up on this instantly, what the baby does is reach. And that's what we do when we feel disconnected with the people we love. We try to reach for them. Now, we may not have even know what that really looks like. We may not even have experienced that. So we may not do it terribly well. The man in my office this morning, his way of reaching for his partner was to say, well, I, why don't you try to be more loving? If only you would do that. And I'm here to help you. And I'll tell you what you need to do. And he couldn't really understand why this didn't result in his wife feeling more loving. <laughs> but she really didn't. It didn't work. He was trying to reach for her, but he didn't do it very well. So reaching is the first one. It, it, and it's the most optimal strategy. You reach for other people. And you say, are you there for me? If you can't do that, you don't know how, you're too anxious, something gets in the way, what you do is you push. And this is fueled by anxiety. You push just like he did and you say, why don't you respond differently? Where are you? Why don't you come and hold me? Um, you shouldn't talk to me like that. If you were more loving, we'd be happier together. Why do you always argue? Can't you ever? Would you? I'd like you to. And it's protesting, complaining, and criticizing that John Gottman talks about. But we see it as being all about insecure, anxious attachment. So if you can't reach and get the response you need from the other person, you push. Trouble with that one is... Um, your negative signals are a danger cue to the other person's mammalian brain and often you're seen as a threat and you're trying to get them to come towards you but often you push them away. The other thing the baby does on the Edtronic YouTube is when the mother really doesn't respond to the baby's reaching and the baby's shrieking and pushing and saying, where are you? Come. The baby gets overwhelmed and distressed and turns away from the mother and withdraws, turns away and shuts down in order to shut down her own emotions, in order to somehow change the situation. The tricky one with this in adult relationships is when you shut down, you shut your partner out, that usually keeps your partner triggered and distressed. So three moves, reach, push, try to control, I'll make you respond to me, or shut down, I'll give up, I don't need a response from you, I'm hurting, I don't want to feel rejected or abandoned because we're all terrified of that, I give up, I numb out, I turn away. Tricky part about that one is it leaves you alone. And so does yelling and trying to control, it leaves you alone. The strategy that works is reaching. And um, as a couple said to me this morning who'd been married for 35 years, we never really saw anyone do that. So we got married at 19 and the man said to me, bless his heart, I don't even know what reaching looks like. How do you reach? I ask her, do you want to make out? But I don't know how to reach. So this is fascinating, fascinating, right? But of course he will learn because he desperately, desperately longs to be close to his wife. So what does this all look like if you translate it into therapy? If you translate it into EFT, which my son calls extremely funny therapy, <laughs> um, which, by the way, you know, isn't so strange, uh, because I can remember the days when I would stand up and talk about working with emotion as the most powerful thing in the room, and that emotion was the dance of the, uh, was the music of this dance of love, and that the easiest way to change a dance was to change the music. And if you didn't change the emotional music, lots of luck creating other changes, because you ta can't teach people to dance a waltz when there's foxtrot music playing, it's almost impossible. So I would stand up and give all these incredible reasons for working with emotion, how we knew how to do it, and half the people would leave the room. And then I'd stand up and say, and by the way, love, adult love is an attachment bond, and there's something called constructive dependency, and what we do in our therapy 
is teach people how to reach for each other and have these bonding conversations that we call hold me tight conversations or in the literature we call them uh, blame a softening and withdraw a re-engagement and when they have these conversations our research says that they predict powerfully predict that they're not distressed at the end of therapy and that they're just fine two or three years later um, when I would talk about that people would just look at me like I was crazy and they'd leave the room <laughs> So I'd be stuck talking to about three people. That's changed. I'm glad that's changed. Um, but now, um, you know, it seems like people accept that you can work with emotion, that we understand emotion. We could do a whole talk on that. Emotion's not that mysterious anymore either. Um, and we do understand how powerful it is. We do need to know how to work with it if we're going to work with it effectively. But now, um, when I talk about working with emotion and creating these bonding moments, people seem to understand what I mean. What we do in EFT is we take a distressed couple and we take them through three stages. We take them through the de-escalation of their negative cycle, say demand, withdraw is the most popular one, that constantly creates aloneness emotional isolation, which is traumatizing for human beings, emotional isolation and pain. So we help them look at their darts that they're caught in and we, we say no one has to be the bad guy in EFT. You're not bad people, you just haven't understood love and you're caught in this dreadful dance and you don't know how, you don't even see the dance, you don't know what it's doing to you and it ends up in disconnection and despair. We help people understand that. That gives them a lot of safety because it's like nobody has to be to blame. We help people see the dance, that it's all about attachment. And we help people learn to focus on the dance and help each other out of it so that they can create a basic platform of secure base safety. Um, if you, However, I think many couple interventions or many couple therapists try to do that in their own way and then when they've got that they stop. Couples say well we're happier, we make love sometimes, we're not so mean and it, it feels better. EFT says if you stop there you will get relapse the next time that people hurt each other, dance on each other's toes, miss each other's cues you know, disconnection is inevitable. It happens all the time. What matters is how you manage it. So we say if you stop at de-escalation stage one, they will relapse. And I think of we have pretty good data on that we don't have a relapse problem in EFT, which we are very proud of. And it's quite amazing when you think about it. Um, so we go to de-escalation. The next stage of EFT is restructuring attachment. We help create a positive interactional cycle where people learn to reach for each other in a way that pulls the other person close. We help people talk about the vulnerabilities, their triggers in the relationship, so that their partner starts to understand what's going on with them in the moment before they shut down. We help people um, right in the session not shut down, but turn at that moment and share with their partner talk about their vulnerabilities and talk about their needs. Way back the behaviorist Neil Jacobson said to me, you make such a fuss, all you've got to do with couples is ask them what they need and then get them to negotiate. And I said, I was a graduate student at the time, I said but they don't know what they need. So that's kind of tricky. They think they just need agreement or less arguments, but I don't think that's what they need. And, you know, he said, well, I think that's what they need. What else is there? And my response is they need something different than that. So they need secure attachment. So we help people talk about their attachment needs in a way that, and we help their partner hear, and we help them create these bonding moments where they can be vulnerable with each other and they can feel this felt sense of security. And then the last stage, we consolidate. We help them create a story of how they've changed their relationship. Every few minutes in EFT, we validate people. We help them feel safe. Um, this is a Rogerian therapy. We're um, non-pathologizing. We're collaborative. 
we help people feel safe, we help them regulate their emotions because if we don't do that they will not turn and take these risks to open up to their partner and move into emotions that are very difficult for them that they maybe haven't even let themselves feel over a lifetime. So safety is a constant concern in all this. But if I say to you that in all across all these stages and in all these times if you really look at an EFT therapist, the EFT therapist is always doing five basic moves, five basic actions. And it's, I want you to think about it as EFT is a combination of an experiential approach to change where Rogers talks to Mnuchin and Rogers understands that it's systemic change in a relationship we're dealing with here. We're dealing with feedback loops of interaction that get take on a life of their own so we're dealing with that we're trying to change that right we're experiential and we're also bonding theorists and bonding theory gives the direction to the therapy and helps us understand people's emotions the main emotions you deal with in um, EFT inevitably you deal with reactive anger you deal with um, no emotion, you deal with people desperately trying to shut down and numb out, which by the way all the research says is amazingly difficult to do. It's incredible hard work physiologically and it ends up arousing you more because you just can't do it, then you explode. So the emotions you see in the dance are mostly our reactive anger and sometimes you ask people they don't even understand why they're so angry. And shut down, withdrawal, numbing out, trying to numb out and then you see that the emotions that people can hardly bear to talk about because it's a risk. Sadness, the fear of loss and that includes loss of connection, loneliness, a dreadful sense of isolation, of being alone, not mattering to the person you love, um, shame, there's something wrong with me, I can't come and talk to you if you really saw me, you wouldn't like me, you'd be disgusted which is fears about the nature of self and how the self is unacceptable and fear. Overwhelmingly attachment theory um, respects and sees the power of fear in human functioning. And if you're working with a couple who are distressed and disconnected, you are working with a runaway train of fear of rejection and abandonment. And you help people talk about those fears in a way that their partner can understand and elicits empathy from their partner. So we're working with those emotions. What are the five steps that the EFT therapist does? I call them moves. Um, I do Argentine tango, which is uh, fits perfectly with what I'm talking about. Argentine tango is improvised. It's a PhD in attunement and responsiveness, so you can see why it fits for me. Um, but in tango, we talk about the fact that you improvise constantly, you tune into your partner, you create each dance anew, but you also have some basic moves as a base. So what does the EFT therapist do? The EFT therapist stays in the present. This is a present oriented therapy and stays with the process of interaction and the process of how people create their emotions, how they create the music and then how the music plays out and, how, and creates the dance. So you watch an EFT therapist, the EFT therapist will start almost oh, just again and again with what happened here? Could I stop you for a minute? What's happening right now? What's happening right now, Lewis? You are giving your partner tips and trying to teach her um, how not to move away from you. Is that what you're doing? Could you help me? That's what's happening right now and I'm looking between. And as you do that, Penny turns away from you and looks out the window and sighs. And then um, you become more and more upset. And this is kind of the pattern that happens in your relationship all the time, isn't it? So I'm looking between at the dance. Or I might say, I might look within, because we look at both. What's happening right now, Lewis, as you're, you're starting to, um, you know, your, your 
breathing differently, your voice is going up, you're banging your hand on your knee, could you help me? I'd like to slow you down. We slow emotion down a lot, right, so that we can kind of uh, unpack it and understand what's going on um, and order it for people, help it make sense for people. So what's happening right now is you're yelling. He said, well, I just think she should learn. <laughs> so I'm sorry, could you help me? What's happening right here? There's something here that's very hard and upsetting. What, what is so hard for you? Could you help me my senses? Because as you talk, she turns away. He says, yes, she shuts me out and there's nothing I can do. And I'm not going to put up with it. And you hear the desperation in his voice. And he gets to the point where he says, I guess that's right, I'm desperate. So you focus on present process, the process of interaction and the process of how put people put together and regulate their emotions. Then, that's move one. Move two, you take the elevator down and you explore deeper in the emotion because they can only stay on the surface. All she sees is him, he's angry. All he sees is her shut down. There's tons of other stuff going on. So um, I might turn to her at that point and say, Penny, you turn away. And she says, yes, there's no point in talking. Could you help me? There's no point in talking. And this time I'll stay with her. And I'll walk around in the trigger, her body sense, her thoughts, what her body wants to do, move away. And I'll walk around in that experience with her and help her put it together. And she starts saying, all I hear is that I'm a big disappointment. All I hear is that I'm a bad wife. And then she looks down and her face goes really tight. And I stay with that. And I say, could you help me? This is very painful for you. You're a bad wife. That's where you go. In the moment before you shut down, you say to yourself, I'm a bad wife. She says, yes, I'll never please him. I'm not good enough. So I give up and I just get depressed. I give up. And, and I say, and this, could you help me? Your face looks amazingly sad right now. She says, yes, I just want to cry. So, so this, is, this is very difficult. When he raises his voice, you just hear all this stuff about how you're inadequate, you can never please him. And it's sad, and it's, and could you help me? What else? It's what it says, it's scary. Because I'm on my own here, I just never make it with him. I can never be who he wants. I'm not the wife he wants. And I try so hard, and I've tried so hard for 25 years. Right? So I go deeper into her emotion the emotions that are pushing this drama, the music that's pushing it, and I help her order it, I reflect it, I hold it, then I give it back to her, I distill it. I've discovered it with her and I distill it and I say, I create new music from the new emotion. I create a new emotional signal to change the dance. I say, can you turn and tell him? Can you turn and tell him please? I do shut down, I do shut you out, because all I hear is I'm not good enough for you, and that hurts so much I can't bear it. Can you tell him? So this is move three now. I, I get her to tell him. I set up an enactment, disclosure. And people can struggle with it. People say, no, I don't want to tell him. I, I'll tell him, that's ridiculous. On an information processing point of view, that's ridiculous, because the other person's heard every word. But it's not about information, it's about emotional engagement. The emotional engagement with the other person isn't safe. So people say, I don't want to tell him. I'll tell you. <laughs> so I say, so could you just turn and tell him? In that case, I say, could you turn and tell him? It's hard to even tell you how small I feel in the moment before I turn away and how I feel I can never please you. And so she tells him how hard it is, which is me titrating the risk she has to take with him but she still turns him and tells him it's hard. So Penny turns and tells him, I shut down because I can't bear the message that I'm a bad wife when I try so hard. Now, new emotional experience has been formulated, turns into a new, different kind of cue on a different kind of emotional level to the other person. Then you go into move four. You process the enactment. So we've reflected present process within and between 
we've explored and deepened emotion, we've changed the music, we've created an enactment, we've created a new dance, right? and now a new signal to the partner, now we're going to process that new signal, that new dance, can they do it? I say to her, what does it feel like to tell him that? She says, it feels good. It feels a hell of a lot better than running and putting up 3,000 feet walls and hiding all the time. It feels good. Maybe I, I don't know why I've never learned to do this. <laughs> and then I ask her husband, how does it feel? And what I want him to say, of course, is, oh, I would much rather, it's hard for me to hear, I don't mean to blame you, but I'd much rather you say that to me and even get mad at me than shut me out and move away. That is actually what this man said. So he could tolerate it. When people can't do that, you have to go in and help them some more. They have to help them respond to this new step that their, their partner has just come up with in the dance. It's new and it's unusual. They might be freaked out by it. But this man said, I like it. I didn't know you felt that way. You're an amazing wife. I just get, I just, there are times when I just can't get close to you and it just freaks me out. I don't want you to feel like you're a bad wife. I don't want you to feel small. Um, that makes me sad that you feel that way. Ah. Now, now he responds to her. He comes and joins her in the new dance that's safer, that involves her talking about her vulnerability and him responding to it. So that's much more positive and it's moving towards more secure bonding. So then what do I do? We've created a new dance. I tie a bow on it, I integrate. I say, I focus on the moment. Wow, look at what you guys did. That's amazing what you guys just did. You just shifted out of this pattern that's controlled your relationship for years. You, you were so brave. You went into difficult emotions. You turned and, um, Penny, you turned and took this risk. You're so honest. That's incredible that you can do that. Look at this, you're changing your relationship. Now, what am I doing? Am I just sort of being over-the-top, weird, nice? No. I'm validating. I'm supporting them as they take new risks. And, you know, I'm, and that's my responsibility, to titrate their risks and support them and integrate the risks that they take when they take them. I'm validating and I'm giving them the message. Yes, you can understand love. Yes, relationships make sense. You can understand this dance you're caught in. You can start to shape it. And yes, look at what you just did. You're doing it right now. You're competent. You can do it. All I'm doing is guiding you. You can do it. And the fascinating thing is that somehow that knowledge is wired into our brain. Um, I have worked with um, couples, partners, when they should never have trusted anyone again for as long as, as they lived. We've done research with incest survivors um, where really it's outrageous to ask them to ever trust another human being. You have to go much slower with those guys, but my experience is they will still take these risks if you give them enough support and safety. If you know how to create safety, they will still take them. Because in the end, we are homo vinculum. We are not just social animals. We are the one who bonds. And if you tap into the power of that, um, that is an amazing, amazing, amazing motivator for change. When you do couples therapy that is based on this new science, you have the most amazing arena for change. I get more individual change in couples therapy often than I do in individual therapy because the partners grow each other. Nothing grows people like love. So if you do couples therapy based on this new science, you grow people, you help them grow. They grow each other. You change a relationship in a lasting significant way into a more secure bond. And of course you change the family. The very best gift that any parent can give to a child is to have a secure bond with a partner and to, to join with that partner to create a safe haven with that child. So that was awfully fast. I went through EFT, the science of attachment. I invite you to go to my website, um, 
Sue Johnson website and I never talked to you about a brain scan study we did recently that I think you might find very fascinating. There's all kinds of things on there and you can also go to the ICEFT website www.iceft.com and find all kinds of resources, chapters, articles, training tapes, trainings. Um, I invite you to go and look at those sites. And now I'll stop and you can ask questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. I'm going to start with a couple questions, as I always do, from the virtual audience, and I'll give you, uh, our in-person crowd here a chance to gather their thoughts. Uh, I'll pick up on wh where you just ended, talking about the, uh, um, the effect that, uh, after working with a couple, the, the positive effect it has on the uh, family dynamic as well, and a question that came in focused just on that. Do you find EFT to be effective in group contexts, particularly uh, and most obvious being the uh, the family group. We have one study on EFFT, which is unfortunate because we do it all the time, and we find it very effective. And my colleagues are writing a book at the moment about it, and we start to think about it more, and we intend on doing a much bigger study. But the same principles apply except that with parent and child, the parent is given more responsibility for defining the relationship. Um, but we're still creating those bonding moments, and we still see emotional disconnection as the key. Great. Uh, another question that came in. What are some strategies you employ with, uh, with couples or more likely partners who are skeptical or resistant to attachment theory, bonding science, or EFT? How, how, what are some strategies you employ to uh, get them to buy in at the onset of therapy? Yes, that's a good question. Um, we don't teach on a didactic level. We don't persuade. Um, what we do is we listen to the couple and we move into reflecting what they're saying to us. We move into helping them understand their story and their drama and their problems from an attachment point of view. So it's almost like the main persuasive element is that they experience that we understand them, we understand this drama, we understand their needs. And um, one of the issues with EFT is that we have in our studies and in clinical practice, we have very low dropout rates. And I think it's because attachment speaks to people. People say, this goes to the heart of the matter. So I don't try to persuade people about attachment, but when I turn and say, could you help me? When this happens, could you help me? I'm struggling. Please tell me am I wrong. But it's almost like what you're trying to say is, I get upset because I feel so alone in this relationship. And the person says, yes, yes, that's it. Um, then they understood and heard, and then you should say something like, would you like to buy this book called Hold Me Tight? <laughs> and it will explain so much to you. And the funny thing is, I wrote that book for the public, for people who would not go for therapy. And now, the main way it's used is that everybody gives it to people at the beginning of therapy. And indeed, men in particular love that book because it gives them examples. The gentleman in my office this morning said, I wasn't going to come back here, 
But this man on page 50, see this man on page 50 that you talk about in Hold Me Tight? That's me. That's me. And, and you've nailed him. That's what happens to me. So I thought, my God, this woman knows what she's talking about. So and now the feedback stopped, and I hope that you can still hear me, but it's much better for me because I can't hear myself echoing. Um, so that's how we get people enrolled. We get people enrolled by showing that we understand their inner world and their emotions and what they need and their drama. We sometimes give them hold me tight. We also focus a lot on EFT and creating a safe alliance. You have to be able to create a safe haven, secure base in the session. And the only contraindication for EFT, only, I mean, it, it can, you know, show up in lots of different ways. The contraindication for EFT is that you cannot create that emotional safety in the session. Then you cannot work. You can't ask people to be vulnerable when you can't create a basic safety. So if there's threats, whizzing around you know if the part of the cycle is somebody keeps saying I'm going to divorce you then in the first few sessions you have to say listen could you see what happens when you bring up the D word and how it's like throwing a grenade in the middle of this process so could you help me I think it's getting in the way so I would like you to tell me if you could put that threat to divorce your husband on hold for at least um, three months while we work together. You know, and so I'll do that to create safety. But sometimes you can't create safety. People are abusive to each other. They are doing things that are danger cues. You know, if somebody says, well, I am having an affair and I don't intend on giving up my mistress, but I want to see if we can work on this relationship. My answer to that is, it's an impossible situation, it's not going to work because your wife has her feet over a fire all the time and you have the option of turning to somebody else for succor and comfort and she wants to be a priority, not an option so really that's not going to work I don't know how to make that work and your wife isn't going to feel safe with that so we need to talk about that because you're setting up something that isn't going to work we, we focus on what works and what doesn't work. We don't make decisions for people. We don't um, make moral issues for people. We don't teach people top-down about attachment. We help them experience it. Okay, this next question is, uh, is extraordinarily broad, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm really interested to hear what your uh, response might be. What else is present in romantic love other than uh, secure attachment? That distinguishes it from other relationships. Is it just purely physical attraction? What else? How, how do you define? Oh, romantic that's a loving? very good question. Um, what John Bowlby said is that, as far as he could see, and of course, there's thousands of elements to any relationship. You know, I mean, um, we're talking about the core defining elements. Um, what John Bowlby said is, there's three elements to a love relationship. Um, attachment, caregiving, and sexuality. We're talking about adult relationships. But what he interestingly think, what he said was, attachment is the most powerful, it's primary, and it shapes the other two. And all the research on sex, by the way, and bonding is really bearing out that that's true. So um, what Bowlby would say is, of course, apart from, are you there for me? Can we reach and can we pull each other close? There's basic caretaking in a relationship where one of you becomes sick and the, and, and the other one responds with sensitive care. And securely attached people are much better at tuning into the other person's needs and giving really appropriate care. If you look at more insecurely attached people, if you look at anxiously attached people who are always expecting rejection, they want to give care because they want, they value the relationship but they give it out of their own anxiety and, and they're not very good at tuning into their partner. So often they don't give their partner what it is they need. And if you look at people who really aren't comfortable with attachment, who we call avoidant, who are the ones that shut down and withdraw most of the time, they're terrible at giving care. They, um, in, in fact, it is precisely when they or their partner feels vulnerable that they shut down and go away. 
And that's pretty disastrous for a relationship. It creates what we call attachment injuries. And you can look in the literature and see our research on how to heal, how to create forgiveness and how to deal with those attachment injuries. So there's caretaking and then there's sexuality. And, you know, the attachment take on sexuality, we haven't got much time. Let, just, let me give you an, an idea. The attachment view of passion, um, which passion, optimal sexuality, is attachment longing linked to effective attunement and responsiveness. Emotional responsiveness and physical responsiveness go together. So longing, which is the wanting, the connection, it's the emotional engagement piece, linked to attunement and emotional responsiveness. And then you have this incredible safe connection and you can turn and play and go into erotic play. You can explore because somebody's got your back. I'll just give you an image. In our society, we've got this idea that to have sexual thrill, you have to have strangeness, novelty. Maybe if you're doing recreational sex, perhaps, or if you're pretty shut down emotionally, then you need a lot of strangeness and novelty to kind of get you turned on. But I'd suggest to you that the evidence is the best sex happens with securely attached couples who can, it's like their relationship is a tether that holds them safe and they're, they're on a zip line. And just because they have the tether and they're safely connected to their partner, they can go woohoo across the chasm. They can let go and they can feel the thrill and they can explore what it feels like to hang over the chasm. And um, that's an image, but there's lots of research to back up that. And you can look on the website and find an article that we wrote on sex and bonding. It's in the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy. I think it was 2010, but I'm not quite sure. So yes, those are the other elements of a relationship. A really good relationship is where you have secure attachment and you integrate those other two. You integrate sexuality and caregiving. Hi, my name is Lichelle Brugman. I just want to uh, end my course is uh, Psy87506. And I just want to thank you so much for uh, presenting today. It's an honor. And I've read many of your books and publications. So thank you. Um, my question is, uh, you brought up insecurities as far as one partner. What happens if the other partner is securing the relationship? What would be your advice or um, suggestions for that type of couple? One, cu one partner is insecure in the relationship and is more of the needy type. And then the other partner is more secure and is trying to fulfill or um, make the other partner feel more secure in yeah. the relationship. Oh, that happens all the time. Um, you know, we've, I've just done a very fast talk, but what we have to understand is that security and insecurity is on a continuum and it can vary over time. And we know it does. We know it changes. So for example, we've just started working with heart attack couples at the Institute in town. We're doing the, um, an educational program, hold me tight program and we're adapting it to them. And what those couples tell us is that um, often they have sort of low grade, what we call low grade insecurity, but they've managed together. And then one of them has a heart attack. And that changes everything because suddenly their human frailty comes up for them. And they may have had a pretty low, you know, they don't know much about secure attachment, but they have been able to reach for each other when it mattered. And they've got a certain amount of security, but suddenly um, it's not enough. And they, they, their security needs change. And they don't know how to reach for their partner. And their partner, rather than giving them emotional support, becomes a nag who says, have you taken your pills? <laughs> and the whole relationship starts to fall apart. If you have somebody who's relatively more secure who knows a bit more about their emotions, is a bit, more, bit better at regulating their emotions, isn't quite so triggered, is more able to um, talk about their needs, that's good. That just makes EFT easier. But in most distressed couples you see, there's enough insecurity to go round. 
you might have had some bonding experiences in your life. You might not be so stuck in your insecurity, but if you're stuck in a negative pattern of disconnection, you're going to be insecure. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's a, um, but the more, the more what we call secure you are, um, the more strength you have, the easier you are to work with. But what I want you to get is security isn't um, a static thing. You don't get it from your childhood and then carry it with you. It's much more flexible than that. And I think what's important to remember is the power of romantic relationships. I can be um, pretty secure as a person, have pretty good relationships with my parents, pretty good self-esteem, pretty good affect regulation. If I get into a relationship and for whatever reason, your know, life throws us all kinds of curves, I'm thinking about a lady, I have two twins, both of whom are very, very sick with terrifying uh, difficulties and I start to have complete meltdowns and as I have complete meltdowns, my husband's career takes off and he's not there for me. We end up in this terrible cycle. Um, we're triggering each other and I become more insecure. I become, and we, every time I try to reach for him and he isn't there, this confirms my vulnerability. So it's a bit more fluid than you're talking about. I hope that helps. It's um, tricky. We could talk about that for a long time. Hello, Dr. Johnson. My name is Tracy Kate Lucky, And I was wondering, do you believe that men and women attach differently and how that plays out in the therapy oh, good, room? And also, good. how does that then apply to working with same-sex couples? Good question. Um, there is some evidence that, in general, men... Um, um, report or present as more avoidant than women in our society. Um, you know, after all, we have taught men, the, uh, the boy code says that men are supposed to not need people, they're supposed to be competent, strong, focus on performance, um, and you know, if, you're, if you need somebody, then you're a wimp. So um, that's unfortunate, and it's something we need to change. So there is evidence. Men are more likely to be withdrawers in the relationship. They're more likely to be more avoidant. Um, they're more likely to indulge in avoidant sex, one night stands, for example, where they, they don't connect with people. Um, that being said, um, women, are, you know, you can have avoidant women as well. It's, you have to be careful how much you stress that, that um, gender difference. Women tend to be, uh, if they're going to be insecure, they are more likely to end up in the anxious spe spectrum of um, trying to please their partner, trying to connect with their partner, wanting to talk to their partner, wanting cuddling, etc., etc. So there are those sex differences, but I think we need to be careful about them um, because, you know, overwhelmingly, the bottom line is, and I won't talk about research, I'll talk about my clinical practice. I remember at the beginning, people would say to me, you can't do EFT with men. You can do it with women because they'd like to talk about emotion. This is totally wrong. In fact, our research says that EFT works very well with men who are called inexpressive by their partner. And I think that's because we know how to create safety. We know how to help men understand their relationships. And men like that. They like this map to their relationships. We don't blame them. And we experience that in the end, when you get down to the level of vulnerability, men and women aren't that different. You know, the cliche is that men, the cliche is that men just want sex. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat in the session and heard a man who's now in tune with his emotions say, I don't just want sex. You know, if I, if I really need an orgasm, I can give myself one. I want to be desired. And that's what women say too. I want to be desired. I want to know you want me. So, um, you know, what I talk about in love sense is that men and women are much more alike than they are different. But there are those attachment reported differences. Same sex couples are basic. We have a tape called um, EFT with same sex partners. I invite you to look at that training tape. We've, we've written about this um, quite a bit. And really, I see that um, it's all about the same, it's all about bonding, it's all about the same. 
But there are differences you have to respect. Like, uh, for example, um, heterosexual couples are not dealing with minority stress. They're not dealing with struggling over their sexual identity because their family just will not accept that they're gay and keep messing up their coming out process. Heterosexual couples don't have to deal with the fact that if they come out, they're probably going to be fired at work, etc., etc., etc. Heterosexual couples don't have to deal with the threat of HIV. So you have to really tune into that, those differences. But what I want to say about that is there is a sense in which every couple has its own culture and its own issues. And you, if you're going to do collaborative therapy, you have to let that couple teach you about how they see the world and where they find the world hard and where they struggle and their habitual ways of regulating emotions. You have to let the couple teach you. And so if you're heterosexual, I'm heterosexual. So you have to let each gay couple teach you what gayness has been like for them or what, you know, uh, you know, if they're a lesbian couple, what it's been like for them to deal with their lesbian relationship. But then the process is the same. The bonding is the same. I have a feeling I'm going over time, but I'm quite willing to take another question if you want. Yeah, I think we have, uh, we have a, a couple more if you have time. Sure. Great. Thank you. Hi, Sue Johnson. My name is Diana Trout. And Hi, I am Charles. a certified EFT therapist. Hey, hey. And I, I, want, <laughs> I wanted to have you uh, speak a little bit more about the role of shame and how that yes. interferes with connection. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, sometimes, you know, you're, normally our response to um, difficult emotions is to hold them and um, go into them slowly with a client and help distill them and order them with reflection and with soothing um, and slowing it down and helping them put those emotions together. Um, and But that's what we do. But um, shame is a little tricky because every emotion, emotion comes from the Latin word immovere to move. And every emotion has an action tendency associated with it. And the action tendency behind shame is to hide and withdraw. And what we're trying to do in EFT is create um, engagement. So then shame gets pretty problematic. And I'm not talking about working with shame in incest survivors now, which is an even bigger issue, or in people who've been abused or in PTSD folks. But if you basically look at shame. A good example is on training tape five, is it engaging with drawers. Um, I'm working with John on that tape, a client, and he, he's, I say, will you share your fear with your partner? And he says, no, I won't because I'm ashamed. Because if I share it, it means I'm a wimp, I'm pathetic, she'll hate me, she'll be disgusted. So then we stop and we deal with his shame. But I don't go in and, you know, heighten it or talk about it or go through it. I contain it in the moment. And I, I basically give him another frame, which is, um, oh, it's, it's very brave of you to, to start to share these things. And it shows how strong you are. So often we contain shame because the impulse behind shame is to hide the way I see shame is it's basically about fears about the unacceptability of self. Right? And by the way, that means that the therapist has to pick up on that and hold and validate more that sense of shameful sense of self. But it also means that that sense of shame of the self, um, the most powerful antidote to shame is the other person's love and approval. As a good therapist, I have a 20-watt light bulb to shine down into somebody's pit of shame. The partner has a stadium floodlight. The if the person can talk about their fears about themselves and the other person can give that stadium floodlight of approval, that's an amazing antidote to shame. And the partner can do it. I can't do it. I'm a surrogate attachment figure in a session. They're the real attachment figure. Hi, my name's Rosa Patterson, and I'm in Psychology 89997A. 
the yes. first class of my project. Woo! -hoo! I'm so excited. <laughs> um, so my question to you is, how do you deal with personality disorders in couples with EFT and, and when you're working with them? Yeah. This is a Rogerian therapy. So the essence of Rogers is he said you go past the labels. You go past the names for the problems and you go past the labels and you engage in a real way, in a real relationship with the person in front of you as they are. So um, I'll note that somebody's got a personality disorder and then they're John. And the fact that they're bipolar is interesting and sometimes it helps me understand them and sometimes it doesn't. And they're John. And I'm a couple therapist with John, so I'm going to focus, just like with everyone else, on how John deals with moments of disconnection, how he tries to connect with his partner, where he goes when he can't connect with his partner. I'm going to look at the dance of the relationship and how it supports John dealing with his agitation and his depression and how it does not support him, how it triggers him into his agitation and depression. So we put it into the cycle, the, the negative cycle of the partner, we take account of it. We would put depression into that cycle as well, the cycle. Where in this cycle does your depression get triggered and how does it then impact the cycle, right? Um, and we do the same with PTSD. But we are very person orientated. So we'll go past the label and we'll say, okay, you fit this personality disorder. Um, the most powerful example for me is, the, is borderline. Um, the DSM is just a set of labels created by a committee and they all overlap and they're not terribly accurate. And if you look at the borderline diagnosis, for example, um, so depending on who you look at, but 85 to 90 percent of those people um, report that they're a trauma survivors that have been violated by other people in in um, position in very vulnerable ways. So if you say to me, "There's something called borderline, and it's um, people who've been violated by other people, and they're highly ambivalent about connection, but they really need it. They live in a vulnerable world, in a dangerous world. They really need connection." But then when it's offered to them, they realize that it's terrifying because connection with other people has been the source of and solution to danger at the same time. So they dither about in the middle. They ask for connection, then they run away. My response to you is, why would you call it borderline? Um, why not call it complex PTSD? Why not look at it what it really is, which is it's an attachment disorder. It's about amazing high need for an ambivalence for closeness that then interferes with a coherent sense of self and your ability to regulate your emotions. So that particular one I have a big problem with. I don't think it helps the therapist at all. Um, and you know we would see people with that diagnosis all the time at the hospital and we would just treat them as um, complex PTSD. And that just means what, I, the, what I've just described to you. Um, in other words, we turn a label into a drama that makes sense, a way of regulating your emotions that makes sense, and then we work with it. We put it in the cycle, but we work with it. That will bring us to the end of today's lecture, but before we go, I have a couple of uh, quick items. First, and uh, definitely most important, on behalf of the entire university, I'd like to thank Dr. Johnson for such an engaging and informative lecture. We're so pleased you're able to join us today. Thank you for listening. <laughs>